Good afternoon and welcome to the keynote session of our PhD Connections Conference. We're so glad you're all here today. Before I go any further, I want to mention that CART live captioning services are being provided for accessibility. My name is Kirsten Elling and I'm the University Career Center's Coordinator for Graduate Student Career Advancement and the Embedded Career Counselor at Rackham. This conference is co-sponsored by the University Career Center, Rackham Graduate School, and the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies at the University of Michigan Medical School. We have a long list of people to thank for bringing this event together. And since we don't have printed programs for our virtual event, we hope you'll refer to our webpage and join us virtually in thanking our collaborators. On behalf of the entire conference planning committee, I want to congratulate each of you for investing time and energy into this opportunity to explore your career options. In addition to this event, each of our offices offers regular programs and tailored services designed to support and prepare you for a range of career opportunities. We hope you'll continue your momentum from today by taking advantage of these resources, which include individual career counseling, professional development workshops, internship opportunities, and certificate programs, such as the DEI Professional Development Certificate Program, to name just a few. Please refer to our respective websites for more information on the resources available to you to support your career exploration, career development, and job and internship search needs. We'll be sure to share these links in the chat during the session. I'd now like to introduce Dean Mike Solomon, who is the Dean of Rackham Graduate School and the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs Graduate Studies at the U of M. He is a professor of chemical engineering and a professor of macromolecular science and engineering, and has been a member of the Michigan faculty since 1997. Dean Solomon, thank you so much for your involvement in and support of the PhD Connections Conference and for your ongoing commitment to supporting the full range of career options available to students. Please join me in welcoming Dean Mike Solomon to our virtual stage. Thank you very much, Kirsten. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, hello and good afternoon, all. I would uh, also like to add my welcome uh, to you for joining our PhD Career Connections Conference and to offer also my thanks to our partners uh, who are working with us to present this important event. We really rely on uh, our partners and just the, the willing, their willingness and their energy to join with us in this really important uh, event and undertaking. As the name of the conference implies, our hope is to help you as doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows envision connections between your training and career paths beyond the academy. You know, of course, the format of this event is much different than it was when we first launched PhD Connections. Back then, we were gathered in person in the Rackham building. You know, the pandemic has affected nearly every aspect of our academic and professional lives, on top of placing intense personal demands on each of us. Although there is still much uncertainty about when the pandemic will be brought under control, I'm hopeful that increased vaccinations will progressively allow us to participate in the intellectual life on campus this summer and in the fall, like this event. As we move forward in this way, it's not too soon to think about what will change because of all that we have learned and experienced in this year. I do think that there will be lasting changes. These may, not, these may include uh, not only increased acceptance, of remote work options, but also changes in our ability to engage with each other remotely. This in turn, I think could mean shifts in how we pursue networking, interviewing and career exploration itself in ways that we do not yet fully understand. This is possibly a tipping point for the lands landscape of global careers that you're, you're launching to think about today. These changes come as my colleagues and I at Rackham and across campus, we're already leading a charge to re-envision graduate education at UM at U of M in a way that among other things, more effectively prepares students for the broad range of career opportunities in which advanced training and research and scholarship is an asset. In September, 2019, we launched Rackham's strategic vision for graduate education. While so much has happened since then that we could not have foreseen, the graduate school has leaned very heavily during this time on the vision that we embrace them. It's really guarded our choices and our decisions. To that end, we have continued to work with the program faculty to effectively support student academic and professional development needs. 
we have sought to reduce barriers for students to pursue interdisciplinary experiences and degree credentials, including graduate certificates. And we have encouraged innovation and mentoring and other avenues for academic support. Most importantly, however, is that all our decisions and efforts have been guided by an idea of reimagining the graduate academic experience as student-centered and faculty-led with Rackham support. With this in mind, we'll continue to actively engage in providing resources and programs to help you and your academic and professional development needs to support your future aspirations. We know from our own program data that well over half of you who are in the doctorate will pursue a career in a role other than that of a faculty member. So I am very excited that we can host this week's panels and workshops with a range of professionals who have employed their PhD in an array of fields. I would like to take this chance to welcome them and thank them for taking the time to join us and share their insights. I hope that you as student and postdoctoral fellows will find the discussions beneficial and that you will continue to take advantage of all that Rackham offers to help you in pursuit of your career goals. I'm now gonna turn things over to Bangi Gardner, the coordinator of career and professional development in the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies at the UN Medical School, who will introduce our keynote speaker, which I'm very much looking forward to. Thank you very much for joining us today. Maggie, over to you. Thank you, Dean Solomon. Um, and thank you to the entire PhD planning committee for all of your hard work putting this conference together. I'm very excited for today's keynote and for the events of the coming days. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Melanie Cinch. Melanie is a pioneer and a giant in the field of career and professional development for graduate students and postdocs. She currently serves as the executive director of the Women's Leadership Center, the director of the Career Development Center, and as interim assistant dean for academic affairs at the University of St. Joseph, in addition to all of her work as an independent consultant, speaker, trainer, and published author. Previously, she was the Director of Education at the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine. She was the founding director of both the Faculty of Arts and Sciences Career Office of Postdoctoral Affairs at Harvard University and the Office of Postdoctoral Services at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She also has served as an, a consultant to the National Institutes of Health during the planning and launch of the Office of Intramural Cha Training and Education. Her career has been peppered with honors and awards, including the Faculty of Arts and Sciences Impact Award and the Leadership in Action Award for her groundbreaking work at Harvard University. Her book, Next Gen PhD, A Guide to Career Paths and Sciences, which I might add is available at both the University of Michigan Library and the Ann Arbor District Library, leads readers through the career landscape for PhD holders, helps the reader realize the value of a PhD and guides the reader through helpful self-reflection and exploration exercises to find and prepare them for future careers that align with their interests, their strengths, and importantly, their values. Melanie has been invited to give hundreds of talks and keynote addresses at over 80 different institutions. We are delighted and honored to have her here with us today. Throughout the keynote, please take advantage of the question and answer or Q&A function in Zoom to submit questions and upvote questions that you would really like to see answered. My amazing colleagues, Gina and Laura, will be monitoring your submissions and ask uh, questions with the most interest at the end of Melanie's keynote. With that, please join me in welcoming Melanie Cinch to our virtual stage. Thank you for being here, Melanie. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Maggie. That was so generous. And I'm so excited to be back here um, with the University of Michigan colleagues and friends and graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, faculty and guests. Thank you so much to Dean Solomon uh, for joining us briefly. And I would be remiss if I did not mention the co-chairs of PhD Connections, Kirsten Elling and Gina Schrader. They have been phenomenal in helping me to prepare for today and to put together such an amazing event uh, as this week for all of you. So thank you for having me. Uh, my career actually began at the University of Michigan's Career Center. So I'm really excited to know that Kirsten is now embedded at Rackham, helping all of the graduate students there with their career decisions and career planning. I think that's a wonderful step 
but I found through my part-time job as I was a graduate student at Rackham, uh, my part-time job in the University Career Center opened my eyes to the occupation of career counselor. And that's where my path really began. And so I owe so much to the university and it's a pleasure to be back with you today. So I'm going to share my screen with you now and talk with you a little bit about the options that are available for PhDs trained in a variety of disciplines. So I'm pleased to present Career Options for PhDs, opening the doors of opportunity um, at the outset of the conference. I thought it would be interesting to take a look at registrants today. So I wanted to first share a snapshot of who's joining us. In terms of the breakdown between PhD um, students and postdoctoral scholars, um, approximately 75%, 76% of today's attendees are PhDs currently. Uh, and a quarter of our attendees are postdoctoral scholars. I thought it would be interesting for you too to see a breakdown of disciplines who are joining us. So the life sciences uh, represent the lion's share of attendees today, um, followed by engineering, um, students and postdocs in the physical sciences, social sciences, um, humanities and computational sciences. While some of my remarks will be specific to those um, who are studying in the sciences. I wanted to stress that all of my remarks um, can be applicable um, to folks who are studying in the humanities. Um, so I am trained as a humanist first. So I was in um, the Center for Russian and East European Studies when I was at U of M and uh, have studied Ukrainian history. And so I wanted to stress that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a humanist by nature. Um, my second uh, graduate degree is in counseling. And so it's important um, for all of you to know, I think that this talk really is applicable to all of you. And I hope sets you up for an exciting week of meeting with panelists and hearing about their stories, hearing about their pathways into different careers. I actually wrote Next Gen PhD as a guidebook uh, or a handbook for any PhD anywhere who's interested in making a career decision. And so I wanted to share that with you just to let you know uh, most of my remarks will be applicable to all of you. I also thought it would be interesting to ask you, why did you choose U of M? Most of you, of course, mentioned the research that goes on at U of M, that it is second to none, uh, world-renowned research institution. Some of you mentioned your specific program or the faculty advisors that you would have the opportunity to study with, but look at the size of the font of the phrase career development. I wanted to share that with you because so many of you mentioned how important it is that U of M focuses on the development of its graduate students and postdoctoral scholars. And that was indeed a reason for so many of you choosing this university. So I thought that would be interesting to share. In terms of why you are attending today's um, talk and this week's events, most of you are exploring your options right now. So we know that the landscape for academic positions has changed over time. And when I say academic positions, I mean tenure track jobs. Um, that has changed dramatically over the past several decades. Uh, and so many of you, when asked, um, what you're interested in doing next, what your next career goal is um, stated, I'm interested in tenure track positions plus, and you would name other career options that you're interested in. And so, you know, I think this week will enable you to explore those options, to hear more about the backgrounds of different professionals and different occupations, to try to understand more about how you enter different career fields. 
um, many of you in, um, indicated an interest in exploring options, but also applying for positions. A few of you mentioned changing career directions. Um, however, I submitted questions to um, the staff and colleagues that worked on today's event um, because I thought it would be interesting to ask you more about why you're really here today. Uh, and so wanted to share some quotes from today's attendees about what really brings you to today's talk. One person asked, how do you make your profile or resume fit into a non-academic job? How do you identify your interests and career paths that fit them plus your skill set? How do you spin your graduate school experience if you have a poor relationship with your advisor and did not publish as much as your peers? Those are common concerns. What advice do you have for individuals who must navigate career goals with family and partner influences? Every day, my career goal seems to change. And finally, I'd like to find a job that I don't hate that pays me as much money as possible. So I think that's a, uh, it's a good goal. It's, it's important to be in a job I think that you don't hate. Um, I just wanted to share a few excerpts and thank you all, you attendees, um, for completing the survey that we sent out but wanted to share a few sentiments about what people might like to hear about today. And we will discuss some of these areas, but in terms of your specific experience, I wanted to stress the resources that you have available at U of M to assist you in navigating any of these questions or your own personal questions. Another one of the attendees sent in a question to me that was, of all of the universities that you have worked at or attended or even visited, which has the best reputation for career exploration and why? And I can show you why U of M tops my list. There are so many resources at U of M, um, starting with University Career Center, it is a wonderful place for you to go for assistance in starting the process of career exploration, um, starting to understand what's really most important to you in a job and to work with someone one-on-one -on -one to help you explore different options. So Kirsten Elling is actually embedded um, in Rackham. Uh, she works through the University Career Center, but. Um, she is available for individual career counseling appointments in collaboration with Rackham. But the University Career Center also offers workshops on career and job search topics. They have databases that you have access to. And importantly, they have um, an electronic alumni network. Uh, I cannot stress networking enough, and we will be talking about networking throughout today's talk. In terms of resources directly through Rackham, the Professional and Academic Development resource um, headed by Laura Schramm is really important too. Um, they offer core skill development workshops, um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion professional development certificate, internships, a program and public scholarship, and more. And so I encourage you to visit with them and find out more about the resources there. And the last resource, though not the um, last resource available at the institution, but that I want to mention today is the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies um, through U of M Medical School. They also offer individual career advising appointments, um, career exploration panels and workshops, and cohort-based learning and development programs. And just a um, shout out to Mary O'Reardon and um, Shoba Supermanian, who um, work there and uh, alongside Maggie and wanted to share that they have opportunities available for postdocs as well. With all of these resources, I think it's important for you to determine your eligibility by checking on the websites. Um, there is um, more information on each site for you to understand 
what you personally have access to in terms of services. Um, but I think U of M is absolutely at the top in terms of resources for students and postdocs. So I wanted to share with you now um, a little bit more about my story. I have been a career counselor for about 20 years and I focus primarily on um, PhD and postdoc role. Options, career options for um, PhD trained professionals. And through those 20 years, over my 20 years of counseling, um, spending time one on one with PhDs and postdocs, I've heard several misconceptions that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, they actually formed the basis of my research project. So while I was at Harvard, I actually met a labor economist uh, named Richard Freeman, um, who was working at the Labor and Work Life Program at Harvard. Um, Richard actually studies uh, the science and engineering workforce in the US and has for a long time. And I shared with him some of these misconceptions um, that I heard from faculty at Harvard, but also from PhDs and postdocs that I worked with. Uh, one is that all PhDs want to work as faculty members. I think this is a, a common misconception. Another is that the only jobs out there for PhDs are faculty jobs. This, I think, um, is not only a lay person's perspective, but also the perspective of many doctoral students and postdocs. And finally, there are no faculty jobs. So this uh, is not true. I know that right now we're facing one of the most difficult uh, tenure track markets that we have um, pretty much in the history of the academy. Um, but some PhDs and postdocs are still finding faculty jobs. Um, so faculty continue to retire. Um, so we'll, we'll just gray that one out. Um, PhDs have no employable skills. I often hear this in counseling appointments that PhDs feel that they don't have skills that um, employers would really look for or be attracted to um, by the nature of their study uh, because they feel that their study is so narrow. PhDs are not using their research skills in non-faculty jobs. And finally, PhDs outside of the tenure track are not happy in their work. So while I heard these ideas shared um, throughout my time as a counselor and working closely with university faculty members, um, I would actually assert that most PhDs aren't sure of what jobs exist for them. So that's the first point that I would want to make. Second, PhDs have many employable skills that I recognize just by meeting them and talking with them about their work. PhDs are using their research skills in most jobs. And finally, PhDs are happy in their work. Now, when I had my conversations with Richard and shared with him, you know, these are my assertions, I had to tell him, I have no hard data to back this up. Um, and so I wanted to embark on a research project with Richard. The two of us worked together to develop a survey research project um, to explore these assertions. So my research questions then are, what skills, if any, are developed organically during graduate and postdoctoral training? Are these the same skills that are required for success in different applications? Where are PhDs currently employed? What are the primary activities in which PhDs are engaged at work? And are PhDs satis satisfied in their work? So, these are the questions that I heard repeatedly in my counseling appointments. To build out a survey, I actually relied on um, exploring demographics. I wanted to share um, specifics about the educational backgrounds of the doctoral um, candidates that I worked with um, and surveyed, uh, postdoctoral training, and then ultimately employment. To participate in the survey, um, which I actually conducted in 2015, 
I wanted to look at a recent sample. So I looked at the previous 10 years um, of PhD graduates. So to participate in the survey research project, um, the respondents had to have graduated between 2004 and 2014 with a doctorate in the physical, life, computational, engineering, or social sciences. They must have worked, studied, or trained in the US. And I relied heavily on social media to get the word out about the survey project. So it was open for about a month. And after that month, I had collected about 11,000 survey responses. I was really excited about that uh, response rate. Um, of those 11,000 plus, um, just over 8,000 of the responses were usable. And of those that were not usable, um, they primarily graduated outside of that date range. So if they had received a PhD um, prior to 2004, they weren't eligible for the survey research project. But I knew that I was on the right track when people who had graduated uh, prior to 2004 wrote to me directly and said, I want to be a part of the survey. I am a PhD and I am so happy in my job. I have to tell you, I want to let other PhDs know that there is life after graduate school. So I was really excited about that because I felt that I was on the right track. In terms of the demographics of the sample, I wanted to share this slide with you. So most of the survey respondents were women. If you work uh, in uh, survey research at all in your work, you'll know um, women are much more likely than men to respond to surveys. Um, the primary um, response that I received regarding citizenship were from US citizens of permanent residents. Um, so if you look at that number um, of 17% of international scholars, that number is quite low. Um, right now we know that if we look at the postdoctoral population, for example, in the US, um, we know that more than 60% of our postdocs in the US right now are international scholars. So I think that number is low, possibly because of my reliance on social media. Um, I just wanted to share that uh, that number is higher if you look at the large data sets um, through the National Science Foundation, for example. Um, the NSF has the best data sets that we have in the US on um, doctoral education and where doctorate recipients end up in terms of careers. Um, but I found that when I worked with PhDs and postdocs, they were looking for much more granular data. So I, um, that was another reason that I embarked on the survey research project. But um, if you look at the number of 10%, that number represents those people in the sample who are underrepresented in their disciplines. Um, that number uh, of 10%, I'm actually very pleased with because if you look at that time period at the NSF's data sets, um, looking at PhD graduates from 2004 to 2014, the percentage of people who are from underrepresented groups who graduated in that time period with a PhD, it's about 12%. So I was really excited about that um, outcome because um, I relied heavily on my connections with um, different groups of scientists across the country, like the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, um, and uh, the National Society of Black Engineers and similar organizations. If you look at the bottom, I just wanted to share that 70% of the people in the sample were married, 26% were single, and 2% were divorced. So if you know anything about the divorce rate in the US, you'll know that 2% is incredibly low. And just wanted to share that it might be um, interesting to note that this is a very young sample. Um, and so while the US rate of divorce is closer to 50%, um, these people were just married um, because the age, the age range was so low. Um, and so uh, that number 2% may change over time. And then about one in three people in the sample um, had kids. 
In terms of career goals at the start of the PhD and postdoc, I also asked that question. So what were your career goals at the start of your doctoral um, I included these four choices. So faculty position, a research position in industry, a research position in agencies, or an, another kind of position altogether. In the sample, 87% of people indicated that at the start of their PhD program, they were interested in a faculty job. When I looked at the same and asked the same question regarding people um, in the sample at the start of the postdoc, I expected that number to change somewhat. Um, but actually, 82% of people who began a postdoc um, at the start of their postdoc, they indicated an interest in a faculty position. However, the numbers in the other categories jumped up. So more people were interested in research positions, uh, maybe outside of the academy, or other types of jobs altogether. And so that's important for us to note that as time progressed and as people continued to study in their postdoctoral uh, positions, their career interests um, started to change. You'll remember that one of my research questions was also about skills. Now, I would argue that by the very nature of doctoral training, there are so many particular skills that are developed um, but again, I needed very um, concrete data to indicate that PhDs develop skills beyond their discipline-specific knowledge. So I looked at uh, some papers that had been written in our field about um, PhD skill development. Uh, there weren't many. And so I looked outside of that realm and I looked also at um, skills that were highly valued by employers. Uh, for that information, I looked at the National Association of Colleges and Employers and um, also looked at the National Postdoctoral Association and skills that they argue that all postdocs should emerge from their training with. And I developed a list of 15 skills that I think PhDs develop over the course of PhD training. So in addition to discipline-specific knowledge, I argue that PhDs have the ability to gather and interpret information, analyze data, manage a project. I think it would be difficult to complete a PhD if you do not have the ability to manage a project. Um, oral and written communication skills, of course, the ability to work on a team, make decisions, manage others, uh, creativity, um, and career planning is here as well. So in terms of career planning and awareness skills, I know that this is an area that Rackham and the University Career Center and the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies focuses on helping you with to understand how do you go through career planning? Where do you start? Where do you even start if you have no idea how to begin this process? Um, for that, I, again, encourage you to take advantage of the resources available at U of M. They are vast and they are here for you. So what I wanted to look at while I developed this list of skills for the survey, I wanted to ask respondents, do you believe that you developed these skills through the course of your PhD? But also my second question was, do you believe that these skills are required for success on, your, on the job, so in your occupation? So on the next slide, I want to show you the outcome for those two questions. So if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see 95% of the respondents believe they acquired discipline-specific knowledge during their PhD training. Yeah, of course that makes sense. Um, but also the ability to gather and interpret information, analyze data, um, and then the numbers start to drop off a bit. Um, so oral and written communication skills still high, but the ability to learn quickly, creativity, um, innovative thinking, um, project management a little bit lower. But then when I asked what percentage believed that 
those skills were important for success on the job. 80% of the respondents said discipline specific knowledge was important for them in their job. That is such an important message for you, I think, to know that you are studying um, not in a vacuum, you're not studying in vain, you're not um, engaged in discipline specific research um, just for the sake of making the body of research bigger in your particular field, but that discipline specific knowledge can be applied in so many different occupations. And I think that's important for you to know. Um, the ability to gather and interpret information was important and analyze data, but then look further down, oral and written communication skills. 93% of the respondents argue that Oral communication skills are important for success on the job. Of course, that's true. So you can be PhD trained, um, but it's critical for you to be able to communicate your findings and your research outcomes to lots of different audiences. One of my favorite skills that's listed on the right-hand side, uh, if you look at the percentage, 89% of the respondents said the ability to learn quickly is helpful for them in terms of success on the job. And I would argue there is not an employer out there who would not appreciate your ability to absorb material quickly. And that is the hallmark, I think, of doctoral study, that you have the ability to learn and absorb material so quickly that is valuable to employers everywhere. After the um, survey research, project um, came to its conclusion, I met up with a few researchers from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and we actually wrote a paper together um, with this graph. So this maps out the skills needed for particular career fields. So if you look at the difference between research intensive careers and research related careers, um, you can see um, for example, that with consulting, um, there are different levels of skills required. If you look at the bar graph, you'll see under discipline specific knowledge, um, it's quite low and not as important in consulting as, for example, um, goal setting, teamwork, and project management. Um, so that kind of difference um, is something that you can investigate this week as you attend the panel discussions. You can really dig into what skills are required in your particular field. Is it time management? Is it written communication? Will you be writing quite a bit for any particular career field that you're considering? Um, or will you be um, making decisions? Will you be managing projects? Um, will you be collaborating? or will you be analyzing data? Um, so those are questions that I would encourage you to ask the panelists this week at the different panel discussions. Now, if we look at the outcomes, so where the people in the survey project are employed, I thought it would be easiest to start with faculty employment. This uh, tenure track role is one that we are all very familiar with. Um, you work closely with your faculty advisor, your PI, and it's important for you to know, I think, um, a little bit about the sample in that um, occupation. So in the sample, 22% of people in the sample were employed in tenure track faculty positions. Now remember, I was looking at a time span of 10 years. So that would enable some of the respondents to have gone through postdoctoral training as well. 13% were in non-tenure track faculty positions. So adjunct positions may be moving around um, from university to university. I think as we look at these numbers, 22% seemed a little bit high to me and 13% being a non-tenure track faculty position seemed low. So I thought it would be interesting for us to compare that to other data 
from the same time period. So we looked at the most recent NSF data for um, outcomes in 2015 um, for the same time period. So people who earned their PhD between 2014. Um, I thought it would be interesting for you if we looked at um, the largest discipline represented today uh, or group of disciplines, and that is um, those of you studying in the life sciences. So if we looked at PhDs in life sciences over that time period, 7% of them ended up in tenure track jobs. So we can see that my um, survey research is imperfect because I think there is um, definitely social desirability bias uh, in the survey. And that is to say, people who, are, who were in tenure track faculty jobs at the time um, might have found it easier to respond than people who are in non-tenure track faculty positions. If we want to look at the number of people in the US in non-tenure track faculty jobs, I actually looked at um, a study by the American Association um, of University Professors as a point of comparison. So they looked at um, a, a study, uh, they conducted a study of contingent faculty. So contingent faculty being um, primarily adjuncts, but um, people in visiting appointments, people who are in non-tenure track faculty roles. And they looked at every single faculty position in the US. So of all faculty jobs in the US, the AAUP found that 68% of people in faculty jobs are contingent faculty. Um, that is clearly higher than 13%, um, but why is that number so high? That number is so high because so many of um, our universities in the US now have um, had challenges financially and have moved to hiring more adjuncts, possibly moved to eliminating tenure lines. Um, and this is over the past several decades um, and have come to rely more on contingent faculty. So it can be uh, a financial question. Still, if we look at the number of people in our sample, 22% are in tenure track jobs, that leaves 78%. So 78% of the remaining PhDs are employed outside of the tenure track role. But where are they employed? And so I wanted to share with you the sectors where PhDs are employed uh, in the sample. So again, uh, the sample size is just over 8,000 and we have nearly half of people in the sample employed in education. 12% uh, are employed in biotech and pharma, 12% also employed in government agencies, 6% nonprofits, 4% consulting firms, and so on and so forth. And so I wanted to show you, if you dig down and look at more granular data, where in terms of education, where in terms of that sector are PhDs employed? So most of the PhDs in the sample are employed at research universities, 66% working in research universities. 23% are working in liberal arts colleges, 5% um, community colleges, 4% K through 12, 1% um, in comprehensive and regional universities and 1% in medical schools. Um, the way that I parsed out the data was actually looking at standalone medical schools. Um, so when I say research university, um, that includes research universities that may um, also house a school of medicine. So why are PhDs employed um, largely at research universities? I think uh, for several reasons. I've um, spent so much time with PhDs and in individual counseling appointments that I've heard um, from them that it is um, familiar, that they are familiar with this environment, the environment of the research university, that they 
um, often have started families, as we saw. We had many um, newly married people in the sample, um, many people with young children. Um, so they may be putting down roots uh, where their research university um, is in terms of their doctoral study or their postdoctoral study. Um, but also I think uh, it's an environment that they find enriching. I think it's intellectual stim intellectually stimulating. I think uh, being surrounded by people who are engaged in education can be rewarding. And so for lots of different reasons, uh, I think people who are PhD trained might like to work at a research university. However, if we know that the people in our sample did not work necessarily in a tenure track role, what were they doing in a research university setting? There are specific job titles that I can share with you now on this slide came directly from the survey. So people who are interested in remaining at the research university or, at, or on a college campus in general um, should know that Colleges and universities are much like small cities. There are so many different options available to people. And there are many people with whom I worked, my colleagues at Rackham, my colleagues at the University Career Center who are PhD trained, love their jobs. And they have um, the ability to advise and assist current doctoral students, current postdoctoral scholars with their career decisions. Uh, there are people who work as academic advisors. There are PhDs who work as grants administrators. Um, they might work um, in an associate dean role, work on career de um, curriculum development for a particular discipline. They may work in public affairs. I've worked with lots of PhDs who have enjoyed writing for universities. And so it really depends on what you're interested in, what you're good at, and what you care most about in terms of a job. Um, but I encourage you to check out the university. Um, if you are interested in pursuing a tenure track role, which many of you indicated that you are, um, in addition to other roles, um, you might check to see what people who have been most recently hired at your university, um, what kind of profile they have. So look at the CVs of the faculty who are hired most recently in your department. What kinds of publications do they have? Where have they published? And what kinds of grants did they come in with when they were hired? Because that should give you a roadmap to those people who are being hired for tenure track roles. Otherwise, if you spend time with a career advisor or counselor, you will come to understand what is most interesting to you. You'll understand and learn more about different um, opportunities. You'll learn more about career exploration. Um, and one way that you can do that is through um, looking at the Chronicle, the Chronicle of Higher Education. So chronicle.com will introduce you to lots of different opportunities on the student affairs side and on the academic affairs side. So the two different sides of the house. If we then move to the biotech and pharma sector, we'll see that half of the people um, who entered this sector are working in biotech firms, 39% are working in pharmaceutical firms, and 11% of people in this sector are working in um, med devices and diagnostics. So once again, in terms of jobs in industry, I've met with many, many um, science, um, life sciences, PhDs, physical sciences, uh, engineers who might say, well, I'm interested in industry and not know much about it or where to get started. So even that overarching idea uh, or sector of working in the for-profit world is sort of a black hole. So how do you find out more about different occupations? So once again, in industry, there are so many choices for PhD trained scientists um, and you might need to do some more research in terms of understanding the landscape. So 
what does regulatory affairs mean? What do regulatory affairs specialists do? How do they get into the field? Um, if you wanted to work in marketing in a particular for-profit sector, how do you break into that field? Um, what is medical science liaison and what do they do? Is there something about business development that would be attractive to you? And how do you find that out? Um, would you be interested in working as a patent attorney um, or a patent agent? What is the difference? So to answer some of these questions, I encourage you to attend the Healthcare, Biotech and Pharma panel that's taking place tomorrow uh, at 12 o'clock. So it's taking place at noon. Um, there are pictures of professionals up slide now who will be um, part of the panel discussion who work in those fields now, and they can share their career path with you. So bring your specific questions to the career panel. I also wanted to share a few other opportunities um, for you to learn about the for-profit sector uh, this week. One is to learn more about finance. So what kinds of occupations exist in finance? And that um, panel discussion is taking place um, also tomorrow, but at 4 p.m. So wanted to encourage you to continue to check the PhD Connections website for the times um, and the bios of all of the speakers. If we continue into the week, there is a career panel on technology um, with some exciting speakers uh, that's taking place on Wednesday, April 7th at four o'clock. And on Thursday at 4 p.m., there is a career panel on consulting. So again, with PhDs, I have heard uh, from many of my um, counseling appointments, oh, you know, I'm interested in consulting. I, I've heard that it's a good fit for PhDs, but I don't quite know how to get started. I don't know how to go about my job search, what's different about it, um, what are case interviews for, what I often hear is I don't know anyone in that field. Um, this week and these events represent a fabulous opportunity for you to get to know people in the field uh, and stay in touch with them. So, you know, being in touch with people after you have conversations with them, um, like this week, hearing about their, their pathways through the career panels is important. Um, but you can also start online. You can start by looking for people in different professions on LinkedIn. You can network on LinkedIn effectively, starting out via email and then moving eventually to a possible phone call or a Zoom call, um, and then down the road, hopefully meeting back in person with people in different fields. If you look at the government sector, um, and this is the uh, second largest, sector that um, you remember from the graphic of um, people in different sectors. 87% of the respondents to the survey are in federal agencies. 8% are in state agencies, 3% in the military, and 2% in local government. With this, these responses from the survey respondents on their particular occupations, I found there was um, a core thread through all of the people who are employed uh, in the government sector. And that is, they seemed to be working in their disciplines directly. So if you look at these occupational titles, um, field application specialist, astrophysicist, geologist, chemist, watershed ecologist, um, these um, scientists are working in their very fields. So if you are interested in looking at work um, in different areas um, for your, to continue your research, I would encourage you to look at federal, federal agencies um, or state agencies. But that said, there are also opportunities outside of your discipline within the government sector. So working as a writer, working as a person who um, reaches out to the public and shares information about your work, uh, there are a lot of opportunities in um, government agencies. To hear more about people who are working in government and federal agencies, 
attend the panel on Wednesday, so this Wednesday, April 7th at noon, and remember to bring your questions because this is, again, a sector that has um, a particular culture, but it also has a particular process in terms of application. Um, and you can ask very specific questions of the panelists. And finally, I wanted to look at the fourth largest sector um, in my study, and that is the nonprofit sector. This sector is the most diverse in terms of types of institutions. So you might work at a research foundation, a professional society, uh, intergovernmental or non-governmental organization, a nonprofit research institute, a museum, and for example, if you are interested in nonprofit work and you want to be dedicated to a particular cause, check out the Association of Independent Research Institutes. So that is an organization of all of the independent research institutes in the US. And the website is AIRI.org. Uh, so I encourage you to check out that organization because there are so many research institutes in the US that are focused on a particular mission that you might be attracted to. So if you are a mission driven person, I would encourage you to look at different organizations, what they work on, what they stand for, and look at the job opportunities listed there because oftentimes they are looking to hire PhD trained professionals. Again, lots of opportunities, different kinds of job titles in the nonprofit sector, um, lots in museum education, um, and even working in the education sector uh, as director of postdoc affairs, uh, but also working in those research institutes. Um, I have several friends who work as directors of postdoc offices in the research institutes in the U.S. To explore the nonprofit sector, this is a wonderful panel. Uh, there's a panel discussion on Thursday, April 8th at noon um, through the PhD Connections Conference. So I would encourage you to check that out um, with very um, interesting and varied um, careers represented at that panel discussion. So before we leave this section uh, and move on to some of our other research questions, I wanted to share with you some of my favorite job titles from the survey. There were so many interesting job titles that I had not been aware of, but that made sense to me. So volcanologist came up as a potential um, job title or as a specific job title. Uh, that makes sense to me that there are, of course, scientists who study volcanoes. Video game designer can be appealing to lots of different uh, PhD candidates. A zoo nutritionist, and you know, as I said, I hadn't heard of that occupation, but of course there are people who focus on the nutrition of animals in the zoo. Aerospace physiologist. Um, but some of the, the occupations I had never heard of and didn't even really understand, like a nanofossil biostratigrapher, which um, exists and um, may be interesting for some of the candidates in earth sciences, um, geology, uh, and so on and so forth. A foreign affairs officer, you know, there are so many exciting opportunities. But for example, you know, you may be wondering how you could ever embark on a career search when you are not sure what job titles exist out there. I think the panel discussions this week are one way that you can find out more about job titles and different pathways, different steps that people take in different careers, uh, but also uh, just through reading, through reading, through conducting research, you know, Working on your own career and embarking on career exploration is um, just like your research. It will take time, um, but it is definitely worthwhile and will help you to be exposed to different career fields, different occupations, and different job titles. So reading through different 
um, professional societies reading through different um, places where jobs are listed, uh, you will learn more about um, jobs available. So in terms of finding careers that are right for you, there are several steps that I would encourage you to take. Um, so the first is to think more about yourself. So what are you truly interested in? What are you good at? And what do you care most about in a job? Um, again, you do not have to do that in a vacuum. You can work with a career advisor or a career counselor through um, the University Career Center, through Rackham, through the Office of Graduate Postdoctoral Studies. Or you can work um, on it with friends, um, colleagues, peers, family members, people who know you. Uh, having conversations can be so illuminating. So I would definitely say start that process um, now. Um, once you do that, I would encourage you to start to network. Um, many of the PhDs that I've worked with over time have told me, well, I don't know anyone and I don't have a network. Uh, that is not true. Actually, in NextGen PhD, I have a graphic that was developed by my good friend, Laura Stark, uh, who is um, the Director of Graduate um, Student Career Development at Harvard. She created a graphic that will help you to identify all of the contacts that you currently have. So while you might feel like you don't know anyone, you know, you're not sure where to start, you actually have an existing network that you can tap into today. And that might include your alumni from fellow alumni from your undergraduate institution, your peers or people in your, your cohort at U of M. That might include uh, the staff and faculty at U of M. That might include people um, who are on the staff or faculty at your undergraduate institution. And that's just on the educational side. So you also have immediate family, you have extended family, you have friends uh, in your personal network. You have people who are in your day-to-day -day life. I have actually met some PhDs who have developed uh, networking contacts at dog parks. So that can happen. I met my husband on a plane, so that can also happen. Um, so you could meet a partner uh, somewhere. Uh, but on a plane, when you're at a conference, I know that you know so many of our conferences now are virtual and it's quite easy to connect with people like today, one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, through email, through connecting, um, you know, at a conference, at a panel discussion, um, in a chat, it's really important for you to remain um, open to recognizing the networking opportunities that are all around you. Check out professional associations. So in addition to your disciplinary societies, which are super helpful for maintaining your um, standing in the field and for remaining up to date on changes in your field as you go through your research. Professional associations also exist for almost every occupation in the US. So in the US, there are just over 14,000 occupations and there are professional associations for most of those. So for example, we talked about regulatory affairs a little bit ago when we were talking about positions in industry there is an association for regulatory affairs professionals. Um, we did not talk about technology transfer. Um, that is another field that you might be interested in that is helping faculty and graduate students and postdocs take their discoveries and transfer them to the marketplace. So tech transfer um, offices exist at research universities and institutes. And that is true for U of M. And if you are interested in um, tech transfer, there's a professional association called uh, the University, um, the Association of University um, Technology Managers. 
um, with any professional association, you will find their websites tend to be very good. Um, they tend to have access to career portals. So possibly job listings that you haven't seen or that won't be listed elsewhere. That's true for my field. Um, but also they have real people who serve on their boards and those are people that you can connect with if you're just starting to explore a new career field. So if you're interested in, in um, writing, for example, and you find the National Association for Science Writers, go to the board of directors for the National Association of Science Writers and you might find um, the names and personal emails of people who are in that field. And the nice thing about professional association board members is they're all volunteers. So they all have uh, permanent uh, day jobs and they're committed to growing the profession. So they're a very easy group to approach with your questions about the career. So how do you get into the field and how do you get started and what do people look for? If you feel stuck in terms of asking questions um, for example, at the career panels. I also have a list of potential questions that you can ask professionals in Next Gen PhD. So it's just a starting point. You will have your own personal questions that you want to ask as you attend the career panels this week. Um, but you will ask, you could ask about um, how people got started, what kinds of background and training they have, uh, and where the field is going, what they like about their jobs, what they don't like is an important indicator for you as you're making a decision. Another way that you can find out about different careers is through volunteering, collaborating, uh, you can find internships. I've actually worked with some um, PhDs and postdocs who have found connections through collaborations. They might, might have started out as research collaborations, and they kept in touch with the people that they collaborated with, and those connections turned into jobs. So I encourage you to think through that. Um, with volunteering, you don't really have to volunteer for that much time. So that's the nice thing about volunteering. You can set your own schedule. So don't think that you need to abandon your PhD program in order to find out more about different career fields. You can do it at your own pace. Um, you can set short-term measurable goals for yourself. Like this week, I will find two people on LinkedIn who work in museums, um, for example, um, and I will contact them by Friday at five. And so that is a short-term goal, it's manageable, and it's also measurable. So you'll know that if Friday comes and goes and you haven't contacted two people, two professionals, you'll know you haven't achieved that goal and you can um, set a new deadline for yourself. And then manage your time. So managing your time is important. Uh, give yourself enough time. If you find that you are about to defend in a few months, um, and your time is short, you can share that with your career advisor. Um, or if you are in your first or second year of your doctoral program and you're not sure which way to go, um, that's fine. You can work backwards. So from the time that you think it will take to complete your degree or your postdoctoral training, um, work backwards from that date um, to today and set short-term achievable goals for yourself to manage your time most effectively. If you are going on the market, and I know that several of you said that you are, um, there are several things that you can do to prepare yourself for the market. Read through job descriptions carefully. So if you are applying for any type of position, there is so much good information that can be found in job descriptions. So language, phrases, um, information that should appear on your CV or in your cover letter. So read carefully and you can actually echo some of what people are looking for through job descriptions. Then edit your resume or your CV for the reader. So 
depending on what you are applying for, you need to tailor your resume or your CV. So I can't tell you how many people I've hired uh, over time who have sent in um, resumes or CVs that weren't written for the job at hand. And it takes time to do, but it is critical for you to spend time doing this because you will set yourself apart from other candidates if you understand the job and you write for the reader of your CV. If you're looking at faculty positions, for example, and you know that you would only like to work at small colleges, you wouldn't submit the same CV that someone would submit to U of M, for example, um, to a large research institute. Um, you need to really focus on your teaching, your teaching experience, your teaching skills, classes you have the ability to teach. Uh, so it really needs to be tailored. I would also join LinkedIn if you are not on LinkedIn. It is a fabulous platform for networking across all occupations, across all sectors. This includes the academy. Be sure to keep your profile up to date and include a picture if you can, because most employers will want to connect a face to the name. And that is something that you can do uh, fairly easily now, even with your phone, you can have a friend um, take a fairly professional picture of you. With LinkedIn, I would encourage you to use it broadly. So you can join different organizations, you can follow organizations, you can look at job listings on LinkedIn, but do try to increase the size of your network. So after today, I encourage all of you to join, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn because after you connect with me, you'll be able to see all of my connections on LinkedIn. And that's how LinkedIn works. It's a web, um, it's a network of people, of contacts that you can use and connect with um, and talk with, talk with about their jobs. So connect with me after today's talk. Um, my um, LinkedIn profile is open. So the connections, I'm open to all connections. Um, if you want to follow up with me after today's talk, my personal email is also on my LinkedIn page, so you can find it under contact information. Continue to network, as I mentioned, um, every time you attend a talk online, every time you connect with your advisor, um, or not every time, but let your advisor know what you're seeking and the kind of job you're looking for, um, your advisor certainly help you um, if he or she has any connections um, in the field that you're looking in. It may not. Uh, and so I do think, I think it is reasonable for your faculty advisor to know of resources on campus. Um, they may or may not know of other people or have a network of connections um, in fields outside of their own. Um, so it's important for you to recognize that. Um, practice interviewing. You definitely do this with the career advisors and counselors on campus. Um, and that's crucial. Uh, it's crucial for you to um, be ready to respond to lots of questions about your background, your education, your training, and your research. And then follow up with all contacts. So follow up on all interactions that you have with people. Uh, if you find you have um, a great conversation with one of the panelists or you're, you're really intrigued by one of the panelists um, this week, you might um, try to find out that person's um, email. I found almost all of the panelists on LinkedIn. Um, some of them had specific contact information. And so contact them on your own, uh, you know, through Gmail or otherwise, and let them know you you were present at the panel, you really enjoyed the discussion and you wanted to know that if they could follow up on the phone with you for 20 or 30 minutes in the next few weeks uh, because you had some follow-up questions. That is totally appropriate. It happens all the time. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to people after you have positive interactions because that is how most of us found our jobs. 
in terms of um, going back to the research questions, the primary activities at work, um, you'll remember that I um, argued that most PhDs are engaged in research. So according to the sample, three out of four PhDs across the country and all sectors are engaged in research, either basic or applied. So they're regardless of the kind of field that they're in. And I know this is true for my colleagues in career counseling, we can conduct research in our field. We have journals, we conduct research all the time. Um, of the sample, one in three people are engaged in teaching in some way. So I thought that was meaningful too, because um, I have been able to teach through giving talks and you might be able to teach, to present, to share information orally, if that is something that you enjoy in lots of different positions. I wanted to ask um, you quickly, what percentage of people you think indicated in the survey that a PhD was required or preferred for their non-faculty job? So this is a quiz. How many people said that a PhD was required or preferred for their non-faculty jobs in the sample of just over 8,000 people? 78%. 78% indicated that a PhD was required or preferred for their current position. So when I asked the same question about a postdoc, was a postdoc required or preferred for their non-faculty job? 28% indicated a postdoc was required or preferred for their current position. So what do those two statistics tell us? Um, so first of all, this statistic of 78% tells us Employers of all kinds, across all sectors, value the PhD. They value PhD trained candidates. Um, and second of all, 28% requiring or preferring a postdoc um, or postdoctoral training indicates that a postdoc is not required for all occupations, but it is required for some. And that's where your research comes in. So you want to find out, is a postdoc required or preferred for what you're looking for? And so that's really important for you as you embark on this exploration process. Um, and finally, before we leave um, and go on to your questions, I wanted to share our PhDs happy out. And I thought it would be interesting for you if I broke this down by people who are in tenure track roles and non tenure track roles or not employed in a faculty position at all. So of those three, which do you think are the happiest at work? So it turns out that the most satisfied people are not employed in a faculty position, but I'm just being silly because it's, um, if you know we look at satisfied and very satisfied taken together, um, people who are in tenure track roles are very happy, um, but Look at the bottom total. So 42% are satisfied and 38% are very satisfied. So 80% of people in the sample across all types of positions are happy in their jobs. And so I just wanted to leave you with that today because I think it's crucial that um, for you to know that people are able to find satisfying fulfilling work at the conclusion of their PhD or postdoctoral training. And so if you find that you need more assistance and would like to read more, um, check out NextGen PhD. Uh, and thank you so much to um, those who have worked on me, uh, worked with me on this project. Uh, and I look forward to taking your questions now. Hi, Melanie, thank you so much. Um, I'm Laura Strahan, I work at Rackham as the Director of Professional and Academic Development. We got lots of questions from our attendees. Um, our first question is, you talked about transferable skills and your research on skills. How important is it for people to include the skills you talked about on their CV or resume when applying to jobs? 
or is it just a given if you have a PhD that you have those skills or do you need to indicate that in, in your resume or CV? So that's a great question. And my answer is it depends. Uh, so if you are looking for a writing job, for example, and you're putting together uh, a CV that is tailored to a position in writing, I would actually create a category called um, writing experience or science, scientific writing experience or something similar to highlight for the reader the fact that you have done um, significant writing uh, through, through your PhD. Um, so it depends on the skill set. I don't think, for example, you need to create a category um, listing all of the skills that I listed, um, but you could definitely mention them in a cover letter. You could talk about your ability to learn quickly and absorb material quickly. Uh, I think that's an appropriate place for your different skills. Um, and again, I would read job descriptions very carefully. Um, when I was applying for this job at the University of St. Joseph, I was looking at um, and talking with the provost about the assistant dean role, and there were some very specific um, skill sets. They were skill sets that were analogous to the list of 15 that I showed you um, in the job description. And I alluded to them in my cover letter with concrete examples and anecdotes um, that provided evidence of my development of those skills. So you can do that as you write a letter. And that's probably how I would handle it. Melanie, thank you so much for your talk. And, and hello, everyone. I'm Gina Sharetta, and I work on Laura's team. Um, our next question, Melanie, is: Are there any patterns relating to the to age in terms of PhD graduates' capacity to gain meaningful employment, whether on university campuses or outside? What if someone is a graduate of 50 years or older, and are there particular challenges that one might expect? That's a, uh, an interesting question as well. So, with your um, age being a non-traditional um, non -traditional aged um, PhD student. I think your age is much less important than your experience. I think you can use your life experience um, as an asset and I would really frame it that way. I would think carefully about everything that you, um, that you had done prior to enrolling in a PhD program I would frame that for the reader on your CV um, and then include all that you have done throughout your doctoral training. Um, but again, I would focus carefully on the job at hand um, because I think your age matters much less. And I have found this, I've seen this, um, than the experiences that you can bring to a position. And in a, in a cover letter, you can also state um, having been a professional or having been through possibly different career fields, um, you have the ability to um, maybe take a broader view or have the ability to see the big picture and you bring um, different perspectives to the work at hand. So I would really focus on um, what you do have to bring to the table um, because I've seen PhD candidates of all ages um, be successfully employed. We also had a question um, from an international postdoc. So this person is interested in pursuing a research development or administration role, um, specifically in the education sector. And they are wondering if an internship is required prior to job application because they've been told that internships or pro bono work for job experience is restricted for them as an international postdoc. And to even broaden this, I know um, oftentimes our international students, you know, have concerns around gaining job experience given restrictions around employment for them during graduate school. So what advice do you have for that, Melanie? So I think so it's important, it's crucial, of course, for you to check in with your Office of International Students and Scholars. Um, and, I, and I apologize if that's not the name of it at U of M, um, but it is important for you to recognize what the restrictions are um, based on your visa um, type. But uh, that said, I think you still have the ability to gain skills uh, in different areas. 
um, while you may not be able to gain experience in um, a different organization, you might still be able to develop the skills that you need through um, your department, through your research, through your work, um, if you are looking to enter um, business development, uh, you might look at um, ways that you can contribute to your department, um, ways that you can um, look at uh, the field and try to understand what skills are the most important um, and try to um, replicate those in different ways taking on new projects that are academic so they work for you um, and don't um, you wouldn't run into any problems with your restrictions but um, that would bolster your application and strengthen your CV. I'm looking to my colleague Dr. Kirsten Elling to see if we should be wrapping up here for closing remarks or one more question. <laughs> Maybe one more quick question. All right. Well, we will turn then, Melanie. We have one question from a participant for PhDs taking tenure track positions versus industry, so biotech, pharma, et cetera. Which sector is generally better off financially? <laughs> Which sector is better off financially? Well, um, you know, it, it's been it's been a tough year. It's been a tough year for you know for the academy. Um, in response to COVID, it, um, uh, I know that um, we've been hit, our university has been hit fairly hard, um, you know, in terms of enrollment, but, um, but uh, opportunities in industry can also be fairly volatile um, and, and could be unstable. It depends on um, your line of work and what you're looking for. Um, I once uh, attended a talk where it was the Dean of Pharmacy who was speaking at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he said, while industry jobs um, may not, he said that while there um, may not be great stability in industry, there's great mobility. And I think that's a really important message for industry because I personally have seen now over time, so many PhDs move around into different positions um, in industry fairly easily. So if a uh, large pharma is downsizing, um, I've seen PhDs be picked up by, you know, smaller spinoffs or biotechs like that um, with no trouble at all. So I would say, um, you know, it depends on, on what you're looking for personally in terms of environment and culture. Those are very different places. Um, but in terms of stability, um, you know, tenure track roles, yes, it's, it, you know, they can be lifelong, um, but, um, you know, industry can be very rewarding as well. Well, thank you so much, Melanie, for that informative and inspiring keynote. Um, and to everyone who shared their questions, I think we got we got to most of them, um, but it really helps to deepen the conversation when we have questions. So thank you so much for, for everyone who engaged that way. Um, and also a big thanks to Gina and Laura for moderating the Q&A. Um, this is just the first session and an exciting week of panel sessions focused on a variety of industries, um, as Melanie mentioned. Um, including government, consulting, finance, healthcare, biotech, pharma, technology, and the nonprofit sector. Many of you have already registered for some of these sessions, and we really look forward to seeing you there. Um, but if you haven't yet registered, registration is still open. So feel free to register for as many sessions as you'd like. Um, and we're gonna share, we've shared the, the uh, conference webpage before, but we'll share it again in the chat. Um, and then finally, we'd like to ask you to provide your feedback on this keynote session uh, via the link provided in the chat. We always love to get feedback on our programming so we can improve for next time. Um, and with that, I just want to say that I, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the PhD Connections Conference and encourage you all to network and engage with each other throughout the week. As Melanie said, you never know what, what connection can, can lead to you know, interesting information or another connection. So please do engage fully. Um, and with that, I just want to say thanks again to, to Melanie and to everyone uh, who worked to put the conference together. And I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Afternoon.